<laughs> Afternoon, everyone. We're going to be missing a fixture today, but we'll begin anyway. <clears throat> Start with some opening remarks. The United States has consistently made it clear that actions that undermine stability in the West Bank including attacks by Israeli settlers against Palestinians and Palestinian attacks against Israelis are unacceptable. In December, Secretary Blinken announced a visa restriction policy pursuant to the Immigration and Nationality Act targeting individuals believed to have been involved in or meaningfully contributing to undermining peace, security, or stability in the West Bank. On February 1st, President Biden signed an executive order giving us the authority to impose sanctions on persons engaged in such activities. The United States has since imposed sanctions on 11 individuals and 11 ent entities and pursued dozens of visa restrictions under these two authorities. Today, under this policy, and as part of our ongoing effort to promote peace, security, and stability in the region, we are taking steps to impose visa restrictions on an additional group of individuals who have used violence against persons or property or unduly restricted civilians' access to essential services and basic necessities. Additionally, today Secretary Blinken announced the designation of Elor Azaria, a former Israeli Defense Forces sergeant, for his involvement in a gross violation of human rights in the West Bank. As such, Azaria and any immediate family members are generally ineligible for entry into the United States. As we have said on a number of occasions, promoting accountability and justice for any crimes, violations, and abuses committed against Palestinians and against Israelis are essential to st uh, stable, just, and enduring peace in the region. We once again call on the government of Israel and the Palestinian Authority to hold accountable those responsible for violence in the West Bank, and we reiterate that we will continue to impose our own accountability measures as necessary. And with that, Simon? Yeah, uh, yeah follow up on that. Um, so the, these uh, sanctions against, it's a visa ban against Elor Azaria. Um, does does that sort of imply that that he hasn't had uh, that his treatment his, the treatment of his case by the Israeli authorities was not uh, fully in line with the, with the standards of justice that the U.S. would like to see? So we have made clear. Let me speak to it generally first, and I'll speak with respect to his his case. We have made clear that we want to see appropriate accountability for those involved in violations of human rights in the West Bank, those involved in actions that, uh, of violence that threaten Palestinians or uh, actions that threaten Israelis. Um, with respect to this particular statute under which he was designated, um, we are actually required to impose visa restrictions if we find a violation of gross uh, if we find a gross violation of human rights. So I think there are people who will, you know, obviously there was an action that the IDF took against him, right? He did serve time. Um, and I think people can uh, appropriately question whether that was the right amount of time or not. But we are actually separate and apart from that analysis. When we find a gross violation of human rights by a government official, and we did find a, vi a gross violation of human rights by this official, we are required to impose this measure whether or not the government of Israel has taken its own accountability measures. Right, and so this was one of the cases that was involved in earlier this year, the Leahy determinations that, that you guys made, according to the, the memo of justification that um, the organization Dawn obtained and, and, and posted online. Uh, it includes a discussion, it, it, it's, a, it's a, a State Department document, but it includes a discussion of the case and says the Secretary of State determined that the government of Israel is taking effective steps to bring justice uh, bring to justice the responsible member. So, uh, specifically talking about this case, but isn't there a isn't there like a uh, mixed message here? If you're also saying we're, you know, this is eight years after the fact, but we're we're taking this action against this individual, um, but you've also you're also saying, you know, justice has been done in this case. No, so, as I just noted, whether you believe the steps that they have taken are appropriate or not, and we did find that those steps were appropriate for remediation under those stat under the provisions required by the Leahy Law when, when it comes uh, to continue to provide training and assistance to that unit. Separate and apart from that analysis, whether you believe that the appropriate remediation measures or appropriate accountability measures have been taken or not, if we find a gross violation of human rights, and we did here, we are required 
to impose this visa restriction. So that's what we have done. Right. But uh, I guess people would say, you know, people would look at this and say, well, you're, you're imposing a sanction on the individual, but the institution that, that he's part of, uh, the whole point of the Leahy law is to, um, is, is to stop U.S. assistance going, uh, you know, weapons and assistance going to, to units that are involved in, in human rights violations. In this case, you've determined that this unit, this was a gross violation of human rights. Uh, I think he ended up serving nine months in prison. As you said, that's it's debatable. But, um, you know, isn't, isn't, there, isn't there a question here over whether you're really following the, the spirit of the Leahy law where this unit is still able to receive U.S. weapons? So the purpose of the Leahy law, it's not just, I think that, that misstates the purpose of the Leahy law. It's not in every instance to just suspend military assistance. What we are trying to do, what the Leahy law exists to do is to incentivize foreign governments to take corrective measures when units commit violations of human rights. So it's, it's, that's why the Leahy law has written into it, if you find a violation of human rights by a unit, military assistance isn't uh, immediately suspended. You have, to, you have to look and see whether they've taken appropriate accountability measures and appropriate remediation measures, because we want governments to do that. Um, uh, I think it's true about every military in the world that there are times in conflict where you're going to have individual soldiers and individual units who act outside the code of conduct of that unit or potentially act outside the laws of war. And you judge the country by whether they have a system that corrects for those violations and holds people accountable. And that's what the Leahy uh, law is trying to incentivize. So do, do you think that <coughs> you know, someone in, uh, who's been found guilty of extrajudici extrajudicially killing an unarmed Palestinian, um, you know, given everything you said about, about the need for uh, action to be taken on to make sure, um, you know, stability is, is maintained in the West Bank, this is a very uh, sort of febrile atmosphere there. Cases like this have, have, have ha contributed massively to, to that instability. So the institution that we're talking about has basically concluded that that crime needed a nine month jail sentence and that's sort of uh that's sufficient does that does that do you agree that that's sufficient so i'm going to answer that in a rather than rather than weigh in on one specific sentence which ultimately that is a, a question for the israeli legal system i'm going to look at, uh, say that on behalf of the united states we look at it broadly and say that when you look at across the west bank the amount of violence that has been carried out against palestinian civilians there hasn't been appropriate accountability across the board. And so that's why we have, number one, called on Israel to take additional measures to hold those responsible for violence accountable. And it is why we have announced these two policies that I outlined in, at the top of the briefing, the new visa restriction policy that the secretary outlined in December and the executive order that the president put into place in February. And under that authority, under those two authorities, we now have the ability to impose financial sanctions. And we have done that on 22 individuals and entities. And we have the ability to impose visa restrictions, which we have done uh, in dozens of cases. So we are going to continue to call on Israel to do more across the board. I think it's important that it not, it, it, this isn't about, this broadly is not about any one isolated case of violence. This is about a broad trend of increased violence that we have sadly seen right. over the past months and the need for Israel to do more to hold people accountable for it. And that's why we are taking the steps of our own to hold But people. you had the opportunity in this case, you know, this, you've get, there's a, a detailed case here that you've, you've named this individual in a, in a press release. I'm not sure whether you were required to do that. But it's quite clear in this case when it comes to, with reference to the Leahy law, when it comes to the question of whether to um, restrict weapons to the Israeli military, you're, you're willing to take these steps up to that point, and then at that point, you're not willing. Because we just look at the facts as, as they're applied, and, we, and uh, our determination was that with respect to uh, this particular incident, that the uh, unit had appropriately uh, imposed accountability measures, and because of that, remained eligible for assistance under the Leahy law. But that doesn't change the fact that um, we felt it appropriate and are in fact required to oppose this visa restriction today and that broadly across the board we haven't seen enough accountability and that's why we're taking other steps. Jeff, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the, 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 this case, uh, um, Azaria, I think it was 2016, right? I believe so, yeah. 
you, yeah. you know, we're in two, 2024. I mean, it's kind of silly to remind you, but so, eight years later, so I mean, we why have, are we even talking because, about this case Because now? we have been taking a broad look over the past few months mm -hmm. at increased violence in the West Bank. We have yeah. seen a trend in the, of increased violence in the West Bank, and that trend has accelerated after October 7th. And that's why you saw the department announce mm -hmm. new visa restrictions or new visa restrictions of policy in December. And that's why you saw the president announce the new executive order in February. And so we are looking broadly at violence in the West Bank and taking accountability measures yeah, but in this response. Is violence in, but, eight years ago. But my point why is you take that, your uh, accountability for what's happening now. My point is we are, individuals now. we are taking, if you look at the other sanctions that we have rolled out uh, in, in, over the past okay. several months since the president's executive order, you have seen us impose sanctions for actions that have been taken in the past few months. So we are doing that. Yeah. We are looking broadly <laughs> at violence we have seen in the West Bank and where we believe accountability is appropriate, we're imposing it. And you can't name the other individuals? No, and the reason why, I know it's a little complicated, I often stand up here and say that we can't, uh, visa records are confidential and we can't get into them. Um, there is an exception under, uh, for this first case, There, it just ca comes to do with the, the quirks of the law. Um, Azaria was sanctioned under authorities we have under the State Appropriations Act, and under those authorities we are allowed to name uh, individuals' identity when we impose visa restrictions. The others, uh, and, that, and that's for a finding, that's for a, a finding of gross violation of human rights. The others on whom we've imposed visa restrictions, and this is true for the other dozens of individuals for whom we've imposed visa restrictions in the past few months, we are imposing those restrictions under the Immigration and Nationality Act, and the text of that law mandates that we keep the names confidential. Can I just follow up on a timeline? Ask Congress why that's why it's written that way. <laughs> how far yeah. how far back are you guys going in this process in terms of looking at cases that could be considered um, to be subject to the EO or the new visa restriction policy that the secretary laid out? I don't think I want to get into that from here, other than to say, as I noted, we are looking at broadly at violence in the West Bank and actions that undermine the security and stability. Uh, in the West Bank, and we are not, uh, we will not hesitate to take additional measures. You've now seen, I think, a pretty steady tempo you of visa restrictions. I'm not, I'm not going to give it time. We, you have seen a pretty steady tempo now over the past few months of financial sanctions and visa restrictions coming out of this department, uh, and you should expect accountability measures to continue. Can you just help us understand, though, the process a little bit more? Because it seems you rolled out some restrictions for action that's been taken in the last few months, and then there's this one of eight years ago, I mean, it just, it, it's a little bit confusing to understand what kind of process is being embarked on here. Well, as I, as I, I'm not going to get into the full process, but as, as I just said, in response to Leon's question, we are responding to the actions that we have seen in the West Bank and the very disturbing increase of violence in the West Bank. And so we are looking at those, those acts and looking at responses the government of Israel has taken, if any, with in reaction to those acts, and then deciding, making determinations about whether additional measures are necessary uh, on behalf of the United States. And then just one last thing, you said that there hasn't been um, in better accountability across the board when it comes to Israel. Um, is there any, is there any broader action that you guys would consider taking? I mean, if you find all of these violations have occurred, um, is it as meaningful to go after individuals, perhaps like the IDF itself needs to be targeted? So when it comes, first of all, I will say, when it comes to the impact of these sanctions, if you look at the complaints uh, over the past few months from the individuals that have been sanctioned, if you look at the complaints from officials with the government of Israel, they certainly don't think these measures are effective because they have been quite loud in complaining about them and quite loud in... Uh, they do in or they do not think? They do, they, they, they do not think they haven't been... Uh, they think they've been <laughs> ineffective. I probably got lost in a double, in a double negative there. If you just look at, at the, the, the time period since we have been imposing these measures, you have seen quite vociferous complaints from those who have been sanctioned, those who have had visa restrictions imposed on them, and from officials with the government of Israel. So they certainly seem to believe that these measures are, are effective. And I will note, part of the point of taking these measures is not just to impose accountability on people who have engaged in acts of violence or people who have engaged in other acts that increase instability in the West Bank. It is also to let others know that we are paying attention and we are watching and we are not going to hesitate to act.
any noticeable change in their action if they're so frustrated about all this? So we have seen we have seen the government of Israel taking some steps to crack down on settler violence in the West Bank. We have seen them. Uh, uh, at times stopping settler violence and at times arresting those engaged in it, but those steps have not been sufficient. And so we continue to call on the, Israel, uh, the government of Israel to take further steps. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I missed the, the, the top or maybe even more than just the top. Um, but in response to these questions right here about this latest sanction that you uh, introduced, you say that you're judging their effectiveness by the loudness of the complaints? No, uh, the question was about whether they are effective or not. And yeah, uh, we, and you, so and we, we, that, we believe, but, we believe that they the have been effective. from the people who have been targeted and I complaints from the Israeli government mean that they've been affected or just that they're angry? We believe they have been effective separate and apart. How? From, uh, because we believe they are effective in imposing accountability, both with the visa restrictions. And remember, we have imposed financial sanctions as well yes. on individuals that uh, restrict their ability to interact with the United States financial system. My point of that is, um, if these weren't effective, if these weren't imposing a cost, I don't think you would see such loud complaints both from those targeted and from the, the government of Israel. Yeah, but, but, but the cost is that the, these people can't travel to the U.R. Their, fam it's not their families can't travel to the United States and or that any assets that they might have in the U.S., which questionable whether they have any, right? The, it is not limited to that only because, I think, as you know, because I haven't watched sanctions for a long time, uh, an inability to interact with the financial system yeah. often makes it hard for people to carry out all sorts okay. of banking and other activities. But, but in order for sanctions to be effective, they actually have to, I mean, the idea is to change behavior, right? And I think this is what Kylie was getting at. Because what, what behavior have you seen So change? we are early in this process, and uh, I think it is too early to pass judgment one way or the other. As I said, as I said though, um, if we had seen a, a completely satisfactory change in behavior, I think we'd be done. You wouldn't see us imposing additional sanctions and additional visa restrictions. But we continue to see unacceptable levels of violence, and so we're going to continue to take taking these okay. steps well, and continuing to call on the government of Israel to, to do it. This is not, I'll just say, this is not something that happens overnight, right? It's, I get it's it, a, but isn't that a sustained it, campaign it, it, by the United States? And I should, I should also make clear that this is not a problem that can be solved by sanctions and visa restrictions alone. Ultimately, it takes action by the government of Israel, and that's why we continue to push them to take but additional action. isn't that action. an admission that they haven't worked so far? No, it's if not. It's, it is. It if is. You're it, having, if you're having no, continued the, doing the, I mean, the, look, this the, is an the, argument we get into with sanctions uh, on any country, North Korea, Iran, Russia. And, and they are, what they are, behavior has changed? They are, they are, they are one tool. They are one tool that we have to impose accountability and to create incentives to hopefully prevent others from taking actions if they're thinking about the costs that can be imposed upon them. But they are not the only one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Matt, uh, before I ask my question, just to clarify, uh, what about settlers that may be U.S. citizens or U.S. born? I mean, there are a lot of them that have been committing acts of violence and, and other acts and, and from Kriyat Arpa, from the Hebron area and so on. N uh, names are, you know, they're, they're there. Will they be requested to, to be extradited? Would you do something like this? I'm just trying so, to clarify. So you can't make an extradition request absent a criminal indictment. So right. that's the, the okay. first And obviously, we don't do criminal indictments in okay. the Department so of State. So you would have to wait for the Israelis to indict them criminally? No. Have... Well, you wouldn't You wouldn't request to extradite someone who had been indicted in another country. Okay. It would be for an indictment in the United States, but okay. we're getting... Oh, okay, now expanding yeah. these, uh, uh, you know, the, these sanctions and so on, uh, would you expand it to include the um, Smutrich, who is a very powerful minister, he is virtually the governor of the occupied West Bank and so on, and he encourages these acts, and encourages settlements and so on. Would you do something like this to include someone in the Israeli government? So as always, I am not going to preview right. any sanctions uh, action or sanctions uh, or potential sanctions action from here before it happens. Right, but uh, he's, he's, he's doing this on a daily basis. I mean, he's uh, in rhetoric, in action, in every which way. I mean, he, he joined the settlers. He joined them three weeks ago in the Jericho area and so on, and was actually doing physical, you know, acts with the, with the settlers. So why and, not, uh, let's say, include him so in such sanctions? 
I will say that we have made quite clear what we think about certain comments that that minister has made and certain actions that he has taken, and we have engaged directly with the government of Israel about those comments and those actions. But as always, when it comes to any potential sanctions action, you never hear me stand up here and say that we're going to do it or considering it before we announce it publicly. Okay. That's just, that is just a blanket rule with respect to everyone. I think you've, you've been covering this yeah. department longer than I've been here and right, are familiar right. with it. You know, that, you know and true uh, to form, I mean, back in January 2023, uh, your predecessor, I remember that the issue of both Smotrich and Ben Gvir were raised and whether they're going to be, you know, put on a list of... Uh, you know, persona non grata list or something like this and so on. So this is not a new issue. It's been around for a very, very long time with these two particular persons. Why not? I mean, since they, their actions have spoken a lot louder than their words in the last, you know, whatever months, 17, 18 months, uh, why, why not in, include them in such sections? And this way it would, ha it would be So we continue to engage with the government of Israel, Israel about policies that those ministers and impose that with which we disagree and other actions that the government of Israel takes with which we disagree in the same way that we engage with governments all around the world mm -hmm. about actions that they take with which we disagree. Yeah. We As it comes to a sanctions thing, I'm just not going to get into a debate about whether why we will or not do something is because it's not a it's it's not something that we ever do. With one exception you know, as compared to other governments and so on. I mean, next week we're expecting the prime minister of Israel to come to this town you know, he will probably, it will probably be a love fest in, in Congress. There will be a lot of standing ovations and so on. It doesn't matter. But he is, he enjoys the support and he supports these two particular ministers. So, I mean, where is, where is the, where's the beef, so to speak, in these? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, again, uh, as I said, Saeed, we, when you come to specific policies that they have, that uh, those ministers have promulgated, you have seen us engage with respect to those policies. So when, when it comes to, for example, the suspension of transfer payments to the Palestinian Authority, when it uh, comes to the potential suspension of correspondent banking authority, mm -hmm. you have seen us engage on those policies yeah. and see us engage successfully to get those policies reversed, and that's what we'll continue to do. Mm -hmm. One last question about uh, Gaza. Uh, there was a, an analysis uh, in, in uh, Haaretz uh, that says, yeah, you know, the Palestinians were quite hopeful that there will be a deal, but now they have lost hope. Can you update us? You know, are you as hopeful as you were last week? Uh, you know, did, did this hope dissipate in terms of arriving at a, a, a deal and so on? We continue, as, the same? I think, as I said the other day, we continue to be optimistic, but also realistic. Optimistic in that we've been able to reach a framework and overcome some of the very real disagreements that we were facing just several weeks ago. Um, but there are still issues that need resolution, and we continue to work to resolve those. Um, I can only understand, or I'm sorry, I can, I can only imagine what it must be like to be living in the midst of this conflict and how much the people of Gaza must want a ceasefire to be reached. And we understand the suffering that they are going through, and that's why we are pushing so hard every day on behalf of the United States, with our mediators, with the government of Israel to try to bridge these final differences and get a ceasefire because we realize that it is an, it is an urgent priority for those people who continue to suffer. And my last, I promise. My, it's like seven my, or eight, yeah, but, yeah, but that's okay. Yeah. I mean, no. I think you, like the last one you said was the last one, yeah. Saeed. Okay. <laughs> knowing what you No one else has their hand up, so I'm not, you know. Okay. The Q10 hands, right. Go ahead, sorry. Knowing what you know now about the, the course of this latest round of negotiations, now if it falters like the others have, will the onus be placed on Hamas as you guys did in the past, or would it be placed on the Israelis? I, I'm not knowing what you know now. So I, I'm not going to deal with a hypothetical. We're trying to get a deal, and um, uh, if, if it breaks down, we'll deal with the circumstances as they're presented to us at the time, but I'm not going to speculate about what those circumstances would be in advance. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Any reaction or maybe concern from allies regarding the conviction of Senator Menendez? Uh, because he was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, holding a very powerful position at the Congress. Anyone, is there anyone raising among allies eyebrows regarding his maybe past remarks or actions? Like, for instance, in Turkey, he's long been known for his attempts to block F-16 sales to Turkey and then causing a stir 
in ties between Washington and Ankara? Uh, I am not aware of any concerns that have been raised to us, but that would be natural. Congress is obviously an independent branch of our government, and I think most of the foreign governments with which we engage understand that quite well. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, Matt. Uh, crack, crack down on student protests uh, is going on in Bangladesh. At least six students killed by the regime forces. The pro-regime party wing, Chhatra League, has been particularly brutal towards students, particularly, especially girls and women, and has been doing so over and over again for the past one and a half decades. Would you consider Chhatra League is a terrorist organization? Uh, I, I am not uh, going to speak to that with any specificity, but I will say we continue to monitor the violence that broke out um, during the student protests in, in Dhaka um, and continue to urge that protests be peaceful and continue to condemn any violence against peaceful protests. One, one more. Uh, Abu Said, a young student of English literature of the of University of Begum Rokia, stood tall in front of the police to protect, to rescue his fellow students. But regime force did not hesitate to shoot him, and he even did not realize that he had been shot while he trying to rescue his friends. This is how the Sheikh Hasina maintains power just before the sham election. I'm sorry. The Secretary of State said the whole world is watching on the Bangladesh election, and the State Department and U.S. will take necessary all steps to, for, for this, but when people rights are robbed, all of a sudden you become silent. Why is that? So uh, first of all, uh, that's not accurate. You have heard me say several times this week, said it on Monday, I think I said it again yesterday, I said it again today, that we condemn any violence against peaceful protests. We've been watching this matter very uh, uh, closely, um, both from our embassy and uh, officials here in Washington. Uh, have been monitoring the protests, have seen uh, uh, the reports of people dying, being killed in the protests. And we, uh, again, call on the government to uphold individuals' rights to protest peacefully. Thank you. Um, back on Gaza, uh, there is a photo of Israeli soldiers posing in front of the Turkish-Palestinian uh, friendship hospital uh, in Gaza, widely circulated online. Turkish Foreign Ministry also condemned it. And, and I'm going to, to ask your reaction to this because uh, whenever we ask you about civilian killings in Gaza, uh, you blame Hamas, accusing Hamas of uh, hiding behind civilians, operating within hospitals and schools. And here in this case, it appears that IDF soldiers are also using a hospital in Gaza uh, as their military base. There are also reports uh, indicating that. Uh, is this concerning you? And so, do you think this is a violation of international law? So I have not seen this particular picture or this specific report, so I'm not able to comment on but it. I, but I'm, I'm happy. I, I just I, the context is always important, so I'm reluctant to comment on it without knowing the full context. But I am happy to take a look at it um, uh, and have comment for you on it. There was also a report by Washington Post in May, uh, shared the satellite images, uh, using sh showing that you know Israeli soldiers is using this hospital as their base and and generally i mean uh, do you think using hospitals as military base is in, in violation of international uh, law uh, so i'm not going to speak to violations of international law because i'm not a lawyer and i always want to be careful and check with lawyers before i make such proclamations from here um but obviously absolutely no one should be using a hospital as a military base no one in gaza no one anywhere in the world should be uh hiding inside a hospital and using a hospital or using patients uh, as human shields. That applies to everyone. Now, with respect to this specific incident, I just have to look at the details to be able to comment on it. But as a general principle, absolutely, that applies to everyone in the, involved in the conflict. On the, yeah. uh, sorry, I'm changing the subject. Is the State Department worried or have any thoughts on uh, Donald Trump's comments on Taiwan? Uh, first of all, do you agree with what he said, that Taiwan should pay for its defense? And uh, second, uh, uh, it raises the question of what the next president, whomever it is, would do in case there were an attack uh, against a Chinese attack against Taiwan. I wonder if those comments uh, were you in any way or form or another. So um, 
uh, I think I said this yesterday, it's going to be a tricky few months where I have to, to walk the line of what I can and can't say about remarks that are made on the campaign trail. But I will point out that Taiwan has been paying for its own defense. Uh, Taiwan has been purchasing military equipment from the United States to the tune of billions of dollars. And the military equipment that they have purchased supports American manufacturing, supports American industry, supports uh, American technology. So the purchases that they have made not only um, uh, are important, we believe, to regional security, but are important to the United States economy. Now, there is money that was contained in the recently sub passed supplemental bill that, um, that gives us for, I believe, the first time the ability to provide Taiwan with uh, drawdown authority and other weapons from U.S. stocks. But that's, that is a new authority. If you look at the, su the support that we have provided, or the security cooperation that we have provided them over decades, it has been Taiwan actually purchasing uh, military from uh, the United States. It has not been in any way charity from the United States. Um, and I would just point out that we continue to believe that cross-strait peace and stability is essential to the United States. It's essential to the American people. It's essential to the global economy. And the United States, of course, is inherently wrapped up in the global economy. And anything that contributes to instability across the Taiwan Strait um, can potentially damage the economy here at home. So that's why these issues are so incredibly important. Just yeah. To follow up on that. Um, it was last year that you guys um, put forth the first ever FMF package for Taiwan. Yeah, it's part of the supplemental I was referring to. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you just help us understand? Um, before that, there had never been any kind of uh, U.S. military assistance going to Taiwan uh, that Taiwan wasn't paying for. Is that correct? The, correct. Before. Okay. Um, and what prompted uh, the Biden administration and Congress to make this decision now uh, that now there would be U.S. military assistance that would be in part paid for um, by U.S. taxpayers? Um, it was the, a reflection of our longstanding commitment, but obviously we make assessments uh, all the time related to what our longstanding commitment uh, has been to make available to Taiwan the defense articles and services necessary uh, for it to maintain a sufficient self-defense capability. Over time, that has been through weapon sales, um, as I uh, just mentioned a moment ago, and then we made the assessment that it was appropriate to provide FMF uh, assistance as well. Was that because, um, did that open up any defense capabilities to be sent to them that they couldn't buy on their own, or was that just? I would have to take, I would have to take that back and look into it in, in, in more detail. Alex, go ahead. Thank you, Matthew. I have my whole topics, but before that, thing of combination, um, on Ukraine, any concern on you and that some of the narratives about around Ukraine uh, do find their way to, you know, podium in, at a convention, such as the U.S. preventing Ukraine two months after uh, the war from um, signing a peace agreement. I want to give you a chance to respond to that, but it's being cemented at a high level, so any concern about that? Um, so that is not accurate, and I spoke to this uh, yesterday that that wasn't accurate. Yesterday, the day before, I spoke to it not being accurate. Yeah. Um, two questions. Uh, on investment climate statements that you guys announced today, it uh, covers 160 countries and economies. Uh, it obviously doesn't cover Russia, no surprise there, but it does cover Belarus. It covers Georgia, Armenia. It does not cover Azerbaijan. Um, what criteria is being applied here? So the, you're referring to the investment climate statements that we put out. So um, these are statements that we put out, I believe it's annually, um, that provide detailed guides to the investment climates of more than 160 countries and economies. And we provide them to, because they help U.S. companies make informed decisions about doing uh, businesses in overseas markets, both to know the opportunities and also the risks of doing business there. And we find them to be a resource for partner governments to create business environments that are economically sound and sustainable to grow the middle class, empower workers, and promote uh, labor rights. And uh, my question was about uh, any standards being applied by Azerbaijan is not being covered, what kind of message? When it comes to, it, if it comes, I think you can imagine, I'm not familiar with the assessments of the entire 160 countries that are contained in the report, so um, I didn't memorize them, all of those before coming out here, so I'd have to take it back to speak to any one country and what's contained on, on, in the report. On Georgia report, there was no mentioning of uh, Secretary's recent uh, decision to, on comprehensive review, why? Uh, as I just said, 
I can't speak to you. It's a, it's a quite lengthy report that covers 160 countries. I'm not going to be able to speak to you in detail about it from here at the podium. Please take it from me. Fair enough. Uh, on Iran, uh, can you confirm the reports that U.S. yesterday renewed sanctions waiver for Iraq to uh, purchase Iranian electricity? Um, so I'm not going to comment on those reports, but we have long uh, made clear that this is an authority that has existed and has been exercised going back years, going back to previous administrations, something that's been exercised under administrations of both parties um, because it um, uh, helps maintain stability in Iraq. Any, any concern about timing of it? You know, we just talk about you know, US. The timing is dictated by the length of the waiver, Alex. It is. It is the the waivers are for an extended period of time, and when one runs runs out, you extend another one. It's not. It's not dictated by anything else. I got confused because after, after October seven, there were reports that the US and Qatar. I apologize. The US and Qatar <laughs> quietly agreed to block Iran from you know accessing. You know, uh, restricted funds after October seven. That's different. different. You're, you're talking about an entirely different, an entirely that's different that's matter. Environment. So, that's why I said I don't think you're actually confused. They're entirely different matters. Right. So, is it still the case? Uh, you know, October seven. You know, uh, U.S. Qatar restricting Iran from accessing. Is that still the case? Do you, you're Muslim? referring to the six billion dollars? No, they have not obtained a penny of that six billion. Thanks, so Jenny. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Russia and China and North Korea. Uh, Russian President Putin and the Chinese President Xi Jinping agreed to lift the sanctions against North Korea when they recently met, saying that the revision of sanctions against North Korea is inevitable. Can China and Russia lift the sanctions against North Korea at will without the consent of UN members. Well, they cannot obviously um, take unilateral actions on behalf of the United, entire United Nations Security Council. And of course, they cannot <laughs> affect the sanctions that we, uh, the United States, have imposed on North Korea, which remain in effect. On North Korea, North Korea recently declared that uh, it regarded South Korea its enemy. Uh, it also announced today that it would uh, completely abolish exchange channels with the United States. It would, it would what? I'm sorry? It would completely abolish exchange channels mm. with the uh, United yeah. States. How do you think the diplomatic dialogue with North Korea that the United States wants will proceed in the future? So I don't have any updates on that. We have made quite clear for some time that we welcome diplomacy, and we have seen uh, we have seen that desire met with um, uh, provocative actions by North Korea. So we continue to believe that diplomacy is best as the best way to address our very serious concerns. Um, North Korea has pursued a different route, and so that's why we continue to impose accountability measures on them. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, on Bangladesh, uh, we already from Monday, uh, from this podium, AU will confirm and condemn also uh, what's going on in Bangladesh. Six a student already died. Uh, and uh, wh while we are talking here, the Bangladeshi Prime Minister already on her televised uh, address uh, to the nation declared uh, independent judicial committee to investigate uh, how uh, the students uh, uh, was killed. And uh, she also declared that uh, the government will take care every family with the job and necessary uh, income to protect them. By, by that is um, what is my concern here. The quota uh, in public sector job opportunities reform in Bangladesh is a sub judice matter. Currently, an audio clip of a senior opposite BNP leader has gone viral on social media that the violent student movement is orchestrated by the opposition to disrupt the peaceful political environment and that is being fueled by Shibir Jamaat Islami of Bangladesh. What is your comment on that? Okay, so I, um, uh, just as a first matter, I have not seen that clip that's circulating so I couldn't in any way comment on it. Um, but I also don't have any update to the answer I gave on this exact subject 10 minutes ago, 15 yeah. minutes ago, yeah. so. And about, uh, uh, you know, we are in Washington DC last uh, three, four days, we are feeling like we are in Dallas. It's a big kind of climate change. Uh, what uh, USA taking uh, internationally? I think it would be great if we were in Texas. 
I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Texas. That'd be great if we could move the briefing to there. Maybe maybe not in July and August, but yeah. in general, that, that would, I'd welcome that. I just <laughs> wanted ahead. to understand that the IBF's United States policy on uh, climate change, working with China, you know, India, and other countries uh, to protect uh, global mm -hmm. warming, not to become so hot. Uh, I mean, you have seen the administration take any number of actions over the three and a half years that the president has been in office to make clear we need to take steps to reduce climate change. It has been an action. Uh, there have been actions that uh, we have taken on the domestic side, and of course we have made it a major um, uh, aspect of our diplomacy, including appointing a special envoy, John Kerry, work that's now being carried out by uh, John Podesta, and that continues to be um, something that uh, for which we advocate in our diplomatic engagements. Go yeah, if I may, on uh, Russia. Quickly, yeah, now go, go quickly. Very quickly, yeah, on the, how, Matt, how does the State Department respond to the Kremlin uh, reaction on President Biden's slip of tongue when he mistakenly referred uh, to Ukraine President uh, Zelensky as President Putin during uh, the NATO. Uh, so I haven't seen Russia's reaction. Um, I try to make it a practice not to respond to everything that they say. Um, I don't find a lot of what they say very productive, I think, as, as is well known, so without having seen that reaction. But you have diplomatic uh, relationship with Russia. So I, 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 I don't know the I, I, I don't know the comment they said. Anyway, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Chinese Foreign Ministry said that it has suspended negotiation with the United States on nuclear non-proliferation and arms control in response to uh, U.S. weapons sales to Taiwan and saying that U.S. sales of arms to Taiwan were seriously undermining the political atmosphere for continued arms control consultations between the two sides. And what is your response to this? Yeah, I, I think that uh, step that they've taken is unfortunate. The, China has chosen to follow Russia's lead in asserting that engagement on arms control can't proceed uh, when there are other challenges in the bilateral relationship. We think this approach undermines strategic stability. It increases the risk of uh, arms race dynamics. We have made efforts to bolster the defense of our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific, and we will continue to make those efforts in the face of Chinese threats to their security. Uh, I would say it's unfortunately, by suspending these consultations, China has chosen not to pursue efforts that would manage strategic risks and prevent costly arms races, arms races. But we, the United States, will remain open to developing and implementing concrete risk reduction measures with China. However, it requires a PRC willing to also manage strategic risks. Just make sure, last time you guys had this uh, uh, talks on nuclear arms control was the last November, right? Uh, I'd have to check and get things. Okay. And then another one. Uh, yesterday, a North Korean uh, expert and a former CIA analyst has been indicted by the New York grand jury on charges of secretly working for the South Korean government in exchanges for uh, goods and so on. And at one point, she passed handwritten notes to South Korean sites from an off-the-record meeting that she participated in with Secretary Brinken. It's ongoing case, so I, I, I'm sure you don't have the comment. But do you have any concerns on these activities of uh, South Korean intelligence in the U.S. soil? Uh, so you're right. I'm not going to comment on a, what is still an ongoing law enforcement matter. I will say more generally that the reason the Foreign Agents Registration Act exists is so that those of us in government, as well as people in the public as well, but speaking on behalf of the State Department, those of us in government know when we engage with people who come in to, to meet with us, who they're representing, whether, they're, whether they are representing themselves or whether they are representing uh, a foreign government. That's why that law is passed. That's why the Justice Department vigorously enforces it. And it's, of course, appropriate for them to do so. Did you have any conversation on this issue with South Korean side? I'm just not going to get in uh, comment on that at all. When it gets to anything specific to this matter, it's not appropriate for me to comment. That will wrap for today. Thanks, everyone.